Kia ora whanau, I'm Hunter, this is Michaela and this is Russ. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers, men and role models. Hope you all have a great day. Hope all you kids are spoiling the, all the men in your life. And yeah, now Michaela has a verse for us. Um, yeah, so I've been reading in Revelation um, and something that stood out is just that um, God is in complete control of everything that's going on now and all the different things that are going to come. Um, and there's a verse in Daniel 2.21 that says, he controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. And this is just a real good encouragement um, and reminder that God is in complete control um, and that we don't have to be afraid of what's happening in um, the world, but everything is in um, yeah, the hands of God's sovereignty. Hi, thanks Hunter and Michaela for that welcome. It's great to have you on Northgate Live, as they have said. And if you're part of Northgate, I just want to remind you that your telephone calls are making a difference to people. Let's not stop, even as things are looking good in this nation. As uh, Michaela has pointed out, God is in control. And even when you, when you hear of uh, the COVID cases around the world raging, we start to see ours coming down, that's, that's a true blessing. And uh, let's continue to look to God through this time, but let's also continue to care for one another well. So if you haven't rung somebody, do so. You'll see this week I'll be putting up a little testimony of somebody who used their Wednesday to ring somebody who they hadn't connected with for, for quite a while and the blessing it was to both people. So uh, keep watching for that. Come on board with uh, our Northgate live channel on YouTube uh, regularly. We're putting updates up there. And don't forget the Orange program for our children. The latest one is up there now. So if you want to have a look at that with your kids later on and take them through it, it's a time that you can richly invest into their life as well. There is a parent help on that. Okay, we're going to watch a, a short video on uh, the power of dads and we acknowledge that we've probably got people with us watching today who aren't dads, who would love to be dads. We've got others who have, have uh, lost that, that dad who is so special to them and, and others who are sick and we just want to acknowledge and know that you're, you're uh, in a difficult place and where Father's Day is normally a day of celebration, you could be struggling to celebrate. We want you to understand we love you still. And uh, this day goes out to not just the dads, but it also goes out to the role models, to the mentors, to the granddads, to, to each person, uh, each, each male that is watching this video. I want you to understand there's probably people watching you, looking up to you in the way that they would look up to a dad. So influence well. Be encouraged through this day. Be encouraged as we go into to, uh, the message that God has for us today. Bless you. celebrate fathers and uh, and what they've done for us in our lives so let's just pray together Lord we just want to thank you for 
all of the dads that we have in our lives. We want to thank you for the, the positive relationships that we have uh, and the influence that they have in our lives. Lord, we just want to thank you for the fathers that, uh, that make positive influences in everything that we do. Lord, I also want to acknowledge those who, who may be struggling with their relationship with their father or, or do not know their father. Lord, I pray that you'll just bring them comfort in this time as well and let them acknowledge and see that you are the ultimate father and that you are way beyond what our earthly fathers are. Lord, we just thank you for your love and your comfort, Lord, that you can bring. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this time together that we spend as a family, uh, even though we are in this lockdown. Lord, thank you that you're always there and you'll never let us down. Thank you for Paul this morning as he brings our sermon to us. Pray that it will have an impact on our lives and that we'll be changed. Ask all these things in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So enjoy your day together with your, if you're locked down with your family, uh, and I hope you can find some way that you can celebrate and enjoy your father. Have a good day. Well, here we are together on Father's Day online, and I want to welcome you to our Father's Day sermon today. I want to let you into a preacher's life for a moment, if you would let me. It's probably the scariest day of a preacher's life if you're male and you're a dad. It will be scary because of the topic you've got to preach on. I'm preaching in the hopes that I might encourage you in the role of a dad. A role that if I was to be completely honest to you about, it's a role that I can feel as ill-equipped in as the next person. It's scary because for some reason, people will look at the preacher and they look for wisdom and encouragement from us on the topic that we're preaching on. And in this case, it's the qualities of a dad. What, what I see through my eyes, I see a preacher who is someone who sometimes struggles. Someone who tries to do his best as a dad, but has had to sit down on numerous occasions and apologize to their kids for some of the mistakes that he's made throughout his parenting years. However, I can praise God. I can praise God. I have had 26 years worth of wonderful blunders that you can learn from today. And you can learn from them simply because I've also had 26 years of God equipping me. 26 years of having to remind myself, God entrusted my children to me. And thankfully, he never left me to flounder in that role. Even though sometimes, if I was to be honest, I felt that way. But because... He entrusted my kids to me for a short period of time means they're still his kids as well. And he's never walked away from them, not even once. In fact, he's just used me in ways that I've got to say I'm so grateful for. As I think I've probably learned just as much as my kids, I guess, if not more than my kids throughout my journey as a dad. Now, I know that Father's Day is a day where we can normally get together with our dads and we can spoil them. We can give them things like super cheap auto vouchers or Repco vouchers. And, and can I just throw a little statement in here? Those sorts of vouchers are always better than undies and socks. Okay? Dad, you can come to me later and you can thank me for that little word of wisdom, but always a voucher will win over a pair of undies or socks and what used to be hankies. But I also know that while we can celebrate on days like this, there's other people who find this sort of day very difficult. Maybe you've longed to become a dad and for whatever reason that hasn't happened yet. 
There's going to be others watching today that maybe your kids have been caught up in your relationship breakdown to the point that you don't actually get to spend the same amounts of time with your children as you used to. For others, your dads have been gone. They passed. Maybe this is your first Father's Day without them. Maybe it's your 21st. My dad died in 2005. This is my 16th Father's Day without him. Whatever your situation, may the Lord bless and inspire you as I unpack some lessons that I've learned throughout my years of being a dad. I've entitled my sermon, just so you know, Valuable Lessons Learned from Some of the Greatest Blunders Made. And I hope uh, that you will be encouraged as I, I unpack some of my life to you. It's going to be different than a normal sermon where we would unpack a particular piece of scripture. Instead, I'm going to unpack many pieces today as I unpack some of the lessons that the Lord has shown me throughout these last 26 years. I want to bring up on screen my immediate family history for you. Have a look at this. Okay, you will see my mum's name is in the middle there, June McFarlane. My dad's name was Cyril Collins. My mum and my dad had five children. Bruce was the oldest, then Dennis, then my sister Jeanette, then Neville, and then, as I'm sure all my siblings would say, the favourite came along, Paul. <laughs> I want you to look at my parents' names for a second. Oh, sorry, not my parents' name, their parents' names, my grandparents. Now, to my mum, there was Hilton McFarlane, and her mum was Vera McFarlane. Drop your eyes down to my father's parents. As you can see, we have no names there. And that's simply because we have no idea at all about my dad's side of the family. He was abandoned at birth. You'll probably find this hard to believe. We're not even Collinses. That was the babysitter's name that my dad took on. But unfortunately, even she passed away when my dad was young. And then he got passed from pillar to post after that. We knew nothing of his background. My dad grew up never knowing his dad or what it was to have a dad. And so Father's Day for us is going to look really different than Father's Day to other people. And so I want to start this morning by respectfully acknowledging you and encouraging you that no matter what your situation is, God can and he will continue to change your lives as much as we remain open to him doing that. And so it's my privilege to share with you some of my lessons that I've picked up on my journey as a dad. And I pray that they will encourage other dads. Lesson number one I want to share with you this morning is our children are actually God's children before they were ours. How many times have you caught yourself saying, what am I going to do with my kids? Now, I get the sentiment behind that. But here's the truth. They're actually not our kids first. They are God's. They have always been his kids. And they will never stop being his kids. But he's entrusted them to us for a short time. Believe me, a very short time. Psalm 127 verse 3 says that children are a gift to us from God. 
And I think we would all do well to remember this and to remind ourselves of this fact. God has never taken his hand off them. He's only entrusted them to us. It doesn't mean he gave them to us and then left us to flounder after that point. You see, God is still fully involved in their lives as much as he is in ours. And what's more, he knows them even better than what we do. What does Psalm 139 say? It's a beautiful piece of scripture that talks about when each one of us were created by him. In verses 15 and 16, so beautiful. It says none of their bones were hidden from him when he made them inside their mother's body. The psalmist says when he, when God was putting them together, he says God's eyes saw their bodies even before he had formed them. The psalmist said he planned how many days they would live. God wrote down the number of them in his book before they had lived even one of those days. What a beautiful, beautiful encapsulation of how God has created us and how he's created each one of our children. So when we as dads, and can I say mums as well, get to a place where we just have no idea on how to approach a situation or advise our children what to do, who do you think is waiting to help empower us at those times? Who knows our kids better than we do? Let me tell you why I preach to you on this. It's because I've had to learn and relearn and learn this lesson again over and over again in my 26 years of parenting. And I hope I can help someone today learn it in your early years of parenting. Your children were God's children first. And they still are. But the second lesson that I've learnt is one that I struggle to accept a lot of the time. But it still remains true no, long, no matter how much I struggle with it. He has called me to this role as a parent because, are you ready? I don't have what it takes to do the role in and of myself. Can I say that again? He's called me to this role because I don't have what it takes to do the role in and of myself. Now, you're probably brassed off and we're going to lose half of the people on Northgate Live at this particular point. But can I encourage you to hang in for a second and listen to why I say this? Remember Andrew? Andrew and the feeding of the 5,000. Andrew says to Jesus, send these people away. They've been following you for three days. They haven't even eaten. And what does Jesus do? He looks at Andrew and he says, you feed them. You feed them. How ridiculous is that to say to somebody? Now, we know there were 5,000 people there. But actually, if you read the, the books behind it, there's probably a good chance there are up to 10,000 people there that day. And we happen to have the insight that Andrew has five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus says, you feed them. Well, Andrew rightly says, that's all I've got, five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus says, bring it to me. I want you to understand the very next thing that happens, according to scripture, is it says Jesus took the five loaves of bread and two fish. Don't miss that. Because that means Andrew did exactly what Jesus asked of him. He brought it to him. And then scripture records that Jesus lifted it in the air, blessed it, and then said to Andrew, now go feed these people. Here's my question. And I often ask this question, and in fact, I've asked it before at Northgate. What did Jesus give back to Andrew? 
Was it enough food for 10,000 people? I don't think so. Not unless Andrew was a very big man, he couldn't have carried that amount of food. I think he probably gave him back five loaves of bread and two fish. If Jesus had done that to me, I probably would have questioned him, but not Andrew. Andrew turns, and because of his obedience, a mighty miracle is done. He starts giving out from those five loaves of bread and two fish. And the multitude of people are fed. How often do we think that we have to have it all together? And personally, we can meet every one of our children's needs. We can't. But we do know the one who can. And so we give to him what we have, which is never going to be enough. And if we will give it to Jesus, he will make up for our shortfalls. And that's his promise to each one of us as parents. And then it's not our name that's lifted high by our children. Our kids learn to fully rely upon God as they grow up seeing God's provision as being enough. Then we get to my third lesson. It follows on from this one, in a sense, and it comes from a proverb that speaks more of a principle, I think, than what it does as a promise. It comes from chapter 22 and verse 6. It says, Train up a child in the ways of the Lord, and when they get older, they will not depart. In short, think of what the Lord has done for us throughout our lifetime, and then tell your kids through your words and through your deeds. The psalmist says it like this in Psalm 78. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Things that we have heard and things that we know that our fathers have taught to us. We will not hide them from our children, but tell them to the coming generations the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. We're told to teach them. To teach them. Teach them how to respect. Teach them how to honor others. Teach them how to love others. Because if we don't, who will these days? And if you don't, how will the generations who are to come hear about the things that the Lord has done? How will the future generations know how to love their God with all their heart? with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength, and how will they know how to love their neighbor as themselves if we don't teach them now? It's sobering, isn't it? But it's a task the Lord has called us to. My fourth lesson. When you're at home, which happens quite a lot through lockdown, doesn't it? I think we've got to learn to be more present than what we can be. Have you ever been talking to someone and you just know the lights are on, but there's no one there? You know, you know what I mean? Can I ask, how does that make you feel? I thought about that in relation to, to that story in Mark 10, where that man comes running to Jesus and uh, as he runs up, he, he asks Jesus, 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 what must I do to inherit eternal life? Can you imagine if Jesus went, sorry, mate, I missed that. What was, what did you say? So the guy says it again, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus goes, I missed it again. I'm so sorry. What did you say? You know, it's almost funny to think of that happening to Jesus. 
But I wonder how often it happens to our kids when they come running up to us. And when it happens to them, I wonder deep down what that does to them. And how easy is it for it to happen? As I was writing this very point this week, one of my kids, who is now an adult, came down to my room and he wanted me to go with him outside to see something. And I was just about to say, I can't. I need to finish my sermon. When my eyes fell on this very heading, this very point, and on my notes it simply says, when you are at home, learn to be more present. So what do you think I did? I thought, here's a challenge from God. So I went with them. And I ended up having such a good time of connect for over an hour and a half with them. Something that both of us would have missed out on if I just simply said, sorry, I can't, and returned to writing my sermon. And look, it didn't even matter. You're still receiving the sermon on time. I think each one of us would do well to start practicing and look for the times that we need to be more present when we are at home. And then my second to last point that I want to leave with you this morning is to keep the lines of communication open as much as you can. Now, I know that is not an easy thing to do. How do you do that sometimes, especially with our kids as they get older? And you're no longer seen as the fount of all knowledge and information anymore. In fact, how do you keep the lines of communication open when your kids begin to think you need teaching? As it's amazing how much you don't actually know. Have you ever been there? I'm experiencing that now. Well, I want us to look quickly at four things that are known to be guaranteed to close communication down. The first one is when we assume we know what others are thinking or that they should know what we're thinking. The second way, when we focus on to what we want to say while others are talking instead of listening to them. How easy is that one? When we bring up other problems and issues unrelated to the topic that we're actually talking on. And then finally, when we assume we know what's right for others, and so we're not listening to them. Rather, we're trying to convince them of what we think is right. All four of those ways can close down communication. And as I looked at those four things this week, I noticed that all of them had one thing in common. They had nothing to do with listening. And if we want our kids to feel safe enough to continue to want to communicate with us, I think we should learn a prayer. A prayer that goes something like this. Lord, teach me how to listen better. Help me to not want to just respond or jump over the top of my kids. Teach me, Lord how to hear well, and how to speak less. And then the final lesson that I want to leave with you, and can I just assure you, it's not just six lessons I've learned, and I would love to hear some of the lessons that you've learned. But the last one I want to leave with you is the fact that we always need to remain teachable ourselves. God's not finished with any one of us yet. And I think there's two sources we need to remain open to learning from as parents. The first source, are you ready for this? Is our very own children. Remember, it was God who chose you to be their son or their daughter's parent. My 26 years of parenting has actually shown me just how little I really know. Yet as I look back on some of my greatest life lessons in my last 26 years as a parent, much of them have come via my kids. 
I've had no idea how to help them sometimes, much less what to say. And God has used them to help shape and mold a lot of my decisions. One of my kids taught me the value, are you ready, of listening and responding to what God tells us. Let me tell you how they taught me. It was simple. This child was only maybe three or four at the time. I forget how old, but it was years ago now. We were sitting at the traffic lights in Tauranga. I've told the story to Northgaters, but I know this is going out beyond Northgate. So I want to share it again. While we were sitting at the traffic lights, they turned to me and said, Nana's going to die on such and such a day. And they had a specific day, and it was about two years in the future. I couldn't believe it. I said, what do you mean Nana's going to die? How do you know this? And they simply said, God told me. What do you mean God told you? And they looked at me as if to say, Boo, God told me that Nana would die on this day. Well, I was perturbed by that. I don't mind telling you. And I, I went back and I spoke to Linda on the way home. And, and uh, then I was talking to my pastor at the time, a good friend of mine. And they, uh, I was accounting for the story, and, and he, I said to them, why would God tell a, a three- or four-year-old, you know, that someone is going to die on such and such? And they said, I don't know, maybe you can do something about it. Maybe you should pray about it. And I thought, hey, that's, that's quite a good thing. So for two years we prayed. Now, my mum, unless she's listening to this today, uh, She's now 94, so it tells you she didn't die. But we went down to Tauranga on that day, two years later, and nothing happened. But here's the thing. I wonder what could have happened if I hadn't listened to my daughter that day and if for the next two years hadn't prayed for my mum in that vein. I wonder whether she'd even be with us today. I don't know. This side of eternity, I may never know. But what I did do was I learned from my daughter that day that when you hear something and you truly believe it's from God, respond to it. But, of course, the other way that we are to learn as parents is through the word of God. Dads and mums, that will make a spiritual difference in your own kids' lives. When we as parents study and apply the word and then encourage our kids to do likewise, our kids will be the richer for it. There's a very, very short book in the Bible. It's Second John. And it talks about a woman who taught her children the word. And Paul says in, in verse 4, Paul, no, John says in verse 4, how happy I was to meet some of your children and find them living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded. If we don't teach our kids the truth that's contained in the world, can I tell you, they are no longer going to learn those truths in their big, bad world that they live in today. God has been taken out of this world more and more. If we're going to teach our kids, then it goes without saying, we're going to have to be constantly learning ourselves. And remember what James says, when we learn and listen and read the word of God. Chapter 1 of verse 22 of James, he says, don't merely listen to the word because we deceive ourselves when we do that. He says, do what it says and then teach your kids likewise. So there's a few encouragements through my 26 years of parenting. But I know 26 years for some of you is just a dip in the ocean. We're parents for life. And so please, if you're older than me, understand that I need you in my life. And it could be you've been a parent or, or due to be a parent uh, shortly. You need older 
people in your life to journey with. I need your wisdom. We need each other's wisdom to hear the lessons that you have learnt on this subject. It's not just me that needs it. We all need each other. And so can I say, be blessed in the roles that you have been placed in. Remember, you have your children because God believed in you. He will continue to make you successful in your role as a parent if you will look to him. If you haven't got kids yet, or maybe struggling in that area, then please don't think the sermon doesn't apply to you. Every single person listening today is a role model or a mentor to someone else. You might even not realize someone's watching you, but I guarantee you they are. And may the Lord bless you as you continue to represent Christ to these younger people. Would you let me pray for you? Father, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you that you journey with us. I want to thank you that you never leave us, that you equip us and you empower us to do that which you've called us to. Father, I pray your blessing, your encouragement, your equipping will continue to surround us all. Father, thank you for those that you have brought into our lives. Lord, may we continue to represent you well. For your glory, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, I, I know we're in lockdown. It's going to be a difficult journey to, for many of us to do that. But if your dad is still around, give him a ring today. Tell them why they are important to you. Bless them and bless you guys as you enjoy this day. Thanks for joining Northgate Live. And we pray that uh, this has been useful encouragement for each one of us. Because remember, God's word continues to change lives today. And now, as you go into your world. We love you, Teddy. But God loves his children. May you find your identity in being a son of the only perfect father. May you make it impossible, make it impossible for your daughters to ever find a husband as good as their dad. May you teach your children that their mother is the most beautiful woman alive. She's really pretty. May you risk more, worry less, and play hard. May you lead your family, not as a king, but as a servant. Who protects their hearts, protects their hearts. May you laugh at the little things, the little things. Finally, and finally, may you lay down your life for your family. And may you introduce them to a God, to a God that's already done that exact thing. We hope that you have a great day today. Great day today. Have a great day today. Happy Father's Day. Happy, Happy Father's Day. Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day.